coming through yep excellent um so i guess i wanted to focus on the topic tonight but also from a perspective that i'm you know comfortable talking about given my own experience but i'm going to be focusing on catching the iron bim um as we spoke about um just a little bit about me for people that haven't met me or seen me before um i'm from australia in sydney um i have an architectural background uh, i've worked for about 10 years in um this really fun and interesting industry that is aec um, I've typically delivered using Revit or managed teams delivering projects using Revit during concept through to uh, end of construction phase. Um, so typically, whilst I haven't prepared facilities management platforms, I have prepared models with the intent of being handed over to a facilities management team for the client. Um, at the start of this year, I actually became a BIM consultant. So I currently work in a business called BIM Guru, uh, but other people might recognize me from my YouTube channel, uh, the Aussie BIM Guru. And um, I'd like to thank uh, Microcorp obviously for having me on board. It's always great to meet people around the world and sort of hear about how, how they're using BIM and also what they think about BIM. Um, it was a really interesting presentation before. I really enjoyed um, even just breaking down the words and understand, understanding the concepts, um, but I'll sort of expand upon that a bit as well. Um, so I'm not going to market my business. The only reason I put this slide here of my five business services is because two of them I find are really important to information in what I do on a day-to-day -day basis for my clients. Um, I find if you don't have a good strategy or you don't have a good education on data and information, um, it's really hard to get the results that you need out of BIM. So I find that these are my two services that really tie in to, to what I'll be talking about um, to give it a bit of context. So I guess my focus for this presentation, um, in this case, is going to be um, looking at why the Iron BIM is so important, um, as well as this also just some challenges and some problems that I come across quite, quite regularly um, that relate to information, um, both personally, but also my clients as well. Um, also, I, I wanna touch on sort of why these challenges are happening and what we're doing as an industry to, to face them. And I just sort of put a little diagram here just to touch on a few of the really major data management systems or, or schemas emerging in the industry. And I guess a lot of us have to really start questioning ourselves. Are we, are we leading the pack? Are we ahead of the game? Or are we sort of just doing what we know works and makes us money for now and maybe heading towards a brick wall? Um, when you deal with information, it's always really important to know where you stand in the industry on how developed your information maturity is. Um, so a really critical point that I always encourage my clients to think about. I like to look at information a little bit like a pipeline. Um, essentially, we're, we're starting at the beginning of the pipeline and sending data through to the project um, to the end. And I guess the pipeline never technically finishes because eventually it goes and supports a built asset. But essentially, if there's one thing wrong in the pipeline or there's something missing or someone hasn't installed the right part, we're going to lose data along the way. We're going to lose the, the, the oil. Um, data is the new oil, I guess. It sort of seems to tie into this, this visual metaphor as well, which is quite funny. Um, but I guess why is information so important? I mean, probably most of us realize that BIM is essentially fully dependent upon information. Without information, there's no BIM. Um, we're just dealing with 3D models or 2D drawings at that point. So it's really important that our model is representative of its information correctly. Um, for example, on the right here, I've got a door and I've told the door it's a pipe. As far as the model knows, that's a pipe. It's not a door. Um, so even though we can graphically make something look a certain way, if the data behind the scenes isn't articulating that, then we're really doing a disservice to our clients and to facilities management outcomes, which will be entirely dependent upon these, these practices. Um, and I guess the information is really critical because BIM is all about process and communication. And in a, in a digital age today, um, pretty much all of that also relies on information as well. So I guess one really big issue that I see um, throughout the design, construction and facil facilities management process is that data changes hands and changes formats a lot. And this introduces a lot of risk. If it's not managed and articulated properly in some sort of control strategy, like a BIM management plan. So as we pass between either team members coming and going on teams and taking ideas with them, um, handing over models between design and construction or to facilities management, and also just exporting our models uh, and our drawings to different formats, we do introduce a lot of risk to manipulate or lose data along the way. 
For example, IFCs are a really common model format that I see used for export these days. But a lot of people don't export them properly and most of the information is lost. So a lot of your Revit data, for example, won't make it to an IFC export unless you map that IFC properly to be built from the Revit data. And this is a really common problem I see with um, what facilities management teams are given at the end of a project to work with. And as well as that, obviously, a lot of us are still seeing paper being used on site as well. Um, it's obviously changing. I'm seeing a lot more tablets and iPads out there now, which is great. Um, not promoted by Apple, by the way, any, any brand will do. Um, but I guess it's, I'm still seeing a lot of paper in the way that we design and construct and communicate. And I think the sooner we can get away from that, the more important our data and our information will become. Um, big boom, little I, I guess is what I'm sort of calling this bit. So I guess a model is easy to understand for most people because you can see it. It's something that's in 3D space, it's tangible. You don't need to understand BIM to understand what you're looking at when you look at a 3D model. And a building can be sold, it has value, it has, it has tangible value throughout the, the, the project. Um, we understand we're gonna be selling apartments, for example. But how do we make the client more aware of the value of their information beyond this? Well, that can be a real challenge. And even just also the design teams, sometimes certain stakeholders in a design team won't really value what information means. There's a bit of an attitude of just get, get the drawings out, doesn't matter. And we really need to be more careful than this because a lot of the time we are playing with pretty valuable deliverables for our clients. Um, so I do find sometimes the eye is maybe a little bit too small in the word BIM. I'd, I'd sort of rather it was the other way around, I guess. Um, we've probably all seen this diagram before. Um, it's called the McLeany curve, if you haven't seen, it, seen the, the name before. But I guess uh, failing to plan is planning to fail. And I find with information and data, this is usually the killer. Um, you know, if you're not templating up front and setting things up from the start so that you don't have to set up all the data and the information every single time, so for example, getting all that metadata to be correct from the start, um, then that can really be a, a massive drain on the project resources. And sometimes it means that you may not actually have the time to deliver a, an, an efficient information structure for a handover model or format. As well as this, I find that some firms aren't researching enough and staying ahead of the pack. A lot of the firms are sort of sitting where the turtle was before. They're not keeping up with the industry because they've got clients that don't value information right now but maybe in 10 years time, they might be asking for it. And at that point, money now might not be money later. Um, as well as this, just I find communication is also really critical to making an information strategy work. Uh, people need to be talking to each other constantly about whether it's working and also things that might need to be changed throughout the process. We do have a, a habit in, especially in AEC, of sort of going head down and not, not communicating as openly as we could to make a project really get delivered properly, we do sort of isolate ourselves in, in mental silos sometimes. So I do find that these are some of the critical reasons why um, information isn't always necessarily managed properly. I find that timing of information is something that I'm having to teach my clients different ways of looking at. Um, there's a common belief in AEC but also in BIM, um, that information should always develop over time. We shouldn't give away too much too early. Um, so the idea of LOD, I guess. We're only committed to do an LOD 200 model, so let's only use generic walls. So I, I try to shift my client's mentality sometimes and say that sometimes there's no risk in putting a little bit more metadata in what we do earlier on, because eventually that's gonna become required later. And it might even aid the communication process and increase the chance that you don't miss something earlier in the, in the design process. So I find that information is actually a lot more valuable for us the earlier we can get it into our model and into what we do. So I find that this is something I need to teach a lot of people in today's industry. Um, so for example, on the right, a lot of the time in design models of architects, they'll use just generic block walls. Um, I typically encourage people to use walls with layers because they start to think about more detailed design requirements and we're less likely to have to do rework later on. Uh, one really important point I think to make about how data and information is probably gonna be managed in the future is that data is gonna probably live outside the model for the most part. Um, we're very used to most of our metadata and our data coming from the authoring environment, but we're seeing a lot of intrusions into the industry by many database programs, and also a lot of tools and applications that can move data between the web and the model. And I think this is really gonna lead us to find that we can actually store a lot more data outside the model than we think. Um, some data obviously needs to live inside the model because it's driving elements within the BIM environment, 
but I think that this will really change how we can structure and format our data so we're not necessarily as beholden to our authoring tools. Um, it's more about how we can manipulate our data, how we can data smith what we do. Obviously, um, the cloud is probably the right place to have your head in at the moment. So having your head in the clouds isn't, isn't the worst thing right now. Um, a good example of a cloud platform that I've seen that really emphasizes the value of information and data um, driving a process, um, in this case, coordination typically, is a platform called BIMTRACK. But I see platforms like this as a likely future for facilities management platforms as well, in that not necessarily everything has to be driven by the authoring environment. Sometimes you can hotspot and tag elements and create a database that lives over the top of the model itself. So the model is almost like a background to a bigger data ecosystem instead. Um, so I think this is something that people should be aware of and should be experimenting with as well. There's obviously a lot of money in this environment you can make as well. If you can find a way to make this obviously the, the platform of the future. Um, another thing I just wanted to share that I think a lot of people probably are aware of um, is that obviously if you can invite people to the conversation of information and data on a project earlier rather than later, um, you stand the chance that you're going to get a better outcome. Um, obviously we need to ask the client uh, what they want out of their model as early as possible. I know that can be a pretty scary thing to ask the client sometimes because sometimes they don't they don't care sometimes is what they might say, but we do need to sort of shift that narrative saying that, listen, th there's a lot of things you can get out of this in this model or this, this BIM, BIM asset, I guess you could call it. It's not necessarily always just a model. Um, and that will maybe lead them to understand that there are actual things that can save their money, such as getting a performance analysis data out of their active building using a, a BIM integration um, later on. And as well as this, if you can get in touch with the facilities management team that your client operates with, I found that can be a really big step to opening up the potential for what the information and the data should be on a project, um, whether it be a classification system or even just a common asset tagging field or strategy that will mean that their database can actually talk um, with the output of the BIM model once it's handed over. And I think it's worth pointing out that a really great platform to help people communicate that I've seen lately is uh, called Plannerly, or what used to be called LOD Planner, um, where you can host your BIM management plan on the web, and you can also tie in tasks and LOD evolution throughout the project and assign it to various stakeholders. <clears throat> I think um, a really important thing that I also find I need to teach my clients is that sometimes data needs to be fixed at the source. Um, sometimes you need to put a bit more time into how you structure your data in your authoring environment so that you can actually support a more organized and consistent information management strategy. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the client's information management strategy. It can just be an internal organization standard, which means that you can use things like apps and scripts to streamline processes. So information has value um, not only for your client, but obviously for you as well as an architect, engineer, business owner. Um, so I think it's worth being aware of, say, some of these uh, strategies on the left that I've listed here um, that a program such as Revit can support. And some of these can support industry standards like Uniclass uh, classification systems using assembly codes. Um, other ones are unique to Revit, for example, shared parameters. You can see on the right, uh, this is my shared parameter file that I use for my business and also for my template. And you can see the data is heavily structured and it's not necessarily a, a common industry standard, but it's one that at least is clean enough that I can map it to other data standards if I need to. You can see here some of the outcomes that I can get in, in a BIM model using my template um, where I can actually achieve more than one classification system at, <clears throat> sorry, at one time in the model. So sometimes having more information isn't a bad thing. As long as the people using the models know what information is important to the project goals. And this sort of ties back to my point about templating. If you can get some of this base information into your BIM models earlier, um, you don't even really have to think about it once it's there and it's set to some sort of industry standard. Um, you're already gonna be giving your client a much more robust deliverable that they can probably find things to work with. And even say the cost planner would really appreciate probably having uh, fields like uniclass or, om or omniclass fields in the, in the model because that enables them to also interface with their cost planning software if they're using it as well. As well as this, I find that data is really good just for internal uh, review purposes. This is a model that I'm actually developing uh, for training in my company, but I've been really careful with how clean 
I've kept the data in the model and you can see here I'm able to use like the, the wall types are really easy for me to audit because I can just select them by entire type at once. For example, I'm looking at all the fire edit block work in this model and I found a couple of walls that were incorrect in this case. Um, so I, I find that internally, if you can get data to be set up really well, um, that can be a real benefit as well. I also had an example um, that I was actually working on before this webinar. This is the same model. And you can see that the amount of custom data and metadata that I introduced to my content it's quite heavy, um, but I can do a lot of things with this data. And once I've got this family set up the first time around, I just keep using it on project after project. And as a result, I find that you really only have to do the hard work once if you put it in at the start. Um, so I find that's really important. Um, as well as this, I always try to emphasize that we should be focusing on modeling things well, um, not just drawing things well. Uh, the model shouldn't be a means to get some drawings. It should really, should really be something more about getting a meaningful asset that the client can view and utilize. And inevitably, I think one day this is going to be the focus of BIM. Um, we're not going to be as focused on having to legally deliver a set of drawings. Eventually, I think they will realize that a robust BIM model um, can be just as effective for building a building. The challenge is going to be obviously giving the industry confidence that you can legally rely on a model for tolerance, accuracy, uh, QA. There's a lot of issues that come with it. But I think that in the meantime, there's no excuse to be doing low quality modeling. Um, ideally, you should set your fee as an architect or an engineer to support um, the, the highest quality model that you can give to your client to meet their needs, in my opinion. Um, so I do always emphasize that modeling it right is going to give you a better outcome in most aspects, especially in terms of information and data. So I guess my final thoughts um, from what I've spoken about is that planning early, I think is the key to actually improving the quality of information and data throughout the project lifecycle um, all the way up until the facilities management stage. So if you can develop systems and templates that are sort of meeting industry standards, and if you're not aware of industry standards, take some time to research them, such as IFC and COBE, um, then you'll find that you will actually probably make your clients and a lot of the project stakeholders a lot more happy naturally, such as the cost planners. But they'll, they'll love you if you can get a classification system in your model without being asked to do it. <laughs> as well as this, I think communicating amongst the team as early as possible and as effectively as possible and as openly as possible um, is the key to making this all work. Um, I think if you can introduce the client to the value of their data um, as early as possible, that will open up a lot of opportunities for you and them and, and the project as a result as well. So I guess involving everyone is, is the key. Um, so I hope that you've sort of enjoyed um, just, just my thoughts on the value of information. And I, I look forward to sort of exchanging thoughts uh, with the panel after as well. And um, thank, thank you for having me on board.